Yes, my name is Mark Ellis. I'm the Fire and EMS Chief for City of Hallandale Beach. Um, I flew out this morning. I will say in Hallandale, it was partly cloudy. Temperature is about 75 degrees when I left, so don't be jealous. But uh, yeah, it is nice over there. But I've got a friend who actually used to live here, and when I got here, he said, so how's the weather, rainy and cold? And I said, no, when I got here, it was actually kind of nice. It was like 55 degrees and partly cloudy. So that was, uh, so far, it's been great since I've been here. So Seattle is not holding up to what it's supposed to be. <clears throat> All right, so we're going to talk about a number of things. Um, out of curiosity, so I know who's in the room, how many EMS people are in the room? Fire rescue or EMS? Okay, nursing staff? And then doctors, interventionalists, ER doctors, or uh, neurology? Okay, okay, fantastic. Um, all right, so let's talk a little bit about this. Some of this stuff you guys have seen before, so I apologize for those people because we have a, a variety of people in the room. But why are we talking about this? Why are we doing this? We all know that stroke is the number one cause of disability among adults. Stroke disability is a lot different than other disability because patients that suffer major strokes end up where? Long-term care facilities. They end up severely disabled living in nursing homes or living at home being cared for when you have major strokes. You can go out in a car accident tomorrow and more than likely they're going to put you back together again and you're back to work in a few weeks, maybe a couple of months, whatever the case may be. So, you know, it's difficult to compare and people don't always compare fairly the modality of stroke versus other problems like heart disease and trauma and things like that. So that long-term prognosis, people who suffer major strokes truly, truly do end up disabled and will spend the rest of their remaining days in some sort of a long-term facility, long-term care facility, or at home being cared for by nurses, things like that when you've had a major stroke. Um, nearly 800,000 Americans suffer stroke every year, so it is very, very common. We've all seen the numbers. So what are we talking about? little tiny thing like this that causes the problem. <clears throat> 1.9 million neurons are lost for every minute that goes by for patients who suffer from a stroke. That's a great deal of, of, uh, of uh, your neurons that you're losing, more so than when you were drinking in your college days. So, uh, you know, that's something to be thought about. So what are we worried about? This little guy here, this clot. We've seen them before. You guys have had these classes before. Um, you know what the clots look like. What we're concerned about is this area here, is the core. So the core is that damaged area from the clot. Clot occurs here. Distally to the clot, you have that tissue death that happens from lack of oxygen. What we want to do is to try to save as much area as possible, which is what's called the penumbra. This is your at-risk area. This is the area that hasn't died yet, but depending upon how long it takes to get this patient in for treatment, that core will become bigger and bigger and bigger. So you've probably heard before, save the penumbra. That's what we're talking about, save the penumbra, because we want to try to get this at-risk area to get revascularization and get blood flow back to it again. <clears throat> so because of this, you're also only as good as your collaterals. So when you look at patients that suffer stroke, we cannot look at everybody from a, a defined sort of like putting everyone in pigeonholes. So you have patient A that had a stroke three hours ago and you have patient B that had a stroke five hours ago. Who's gonna do better, patient A or patient B? We don't really know. You know, people would sometimes say, well, patient A will because it was only three hours ago. But the reality of it is, is that because of your collaterals, patient B may have much better collateral circulation than patient A and actually fare much better. They, must, they may have better penumbra that's still salvageable versus patient A that doesn't have as good a collateral circulation. So we can't pigeonhole people and put them in certain areas just simply because of time. Time is a factor, but not the only factor. This is also the reason we keep blood pressure up. So um, I can remember having done this. I've been in the fire and EMS for over 30 years now, and I can remember back in the day, you get a patient who had a blood pressure of 220 over 120, and we were fighting to get medication on board to bring that blood pressure down. We were also afraid that people that had strokes, all these strokes were things that bled. And that's what we thought years ago. We didn't realize, I mean, we knew that there were ischemic strokes and there were hemorrhagic strokes, but I think in fire and EMS years ago, the knowledge base wasn't like it is today, and you didn't realize 
more of the, you didn't have that knowledge base you have now, understanding more about ischemic versus hemorrhagic and what the, the percentages are that really hemorrhagic, there's far less of those versus ischemic. But we just assumed that everything that was gonna have a high blood pressure was gonna bleed and we had to get that blood pressure down. And if you remember years ago, giving Procardia, you know, giving nitroglycerin to bring blood pressure down, whatever you could, where nowadays that's not in case the fact at all and we shouldn't be doing that. <clears throat> So time is brain. One of the most important factors here is in fact time. So if you look at this study, you'll see that as time goes on, it actually shows minutes on the bottom, which I added the hours on there for those that couldn't do the math real quick, me being one of them, um, that as you work your way out, you'll see that cases with um, uh, angiographic reperfusion, as you get out to six hours, you see that the chance to have a good clinical outcome becomes less and less and less. So time is important. We do need to get these people treated as soon as possible, because the farther we let them go, the less chance of good clinical outcome. It doesn't mean that they won't have one at all, but our percentages begin to lessen. So we want to get them treated as soon as possible. So let's talk about elbow. Everyone know what elbow is? From fire and EMS, probably not so much because it's kind of a new term. If you're in neurology, you've heard this probably a million times already. But for fire and EMS, we don't hear it as often. So ELVO, emergent large vessel occlusion, or ELVO, LVO, large vessel occlusion. This has become sort of the catchphrase in fire and EMS as of the last year or so. What is it? It's a stroke. But the difference is, is that now when you start looking at stroke, we're not just looking at stroke as being a single, necessarily a single entity. Now we want to know what kind of stroke. So like where STEMI was years ago, where everything wasn't just a heart attack, you had people that had chest pain and you had those that had ST elevation MIs, they were different than just your normal chest pain. And we began treating STEMI different. STEMI patients went to STEMI hospitals, went to cardiac hospitals with cardiac cath labs that could treat STEMI. Stroke, needs to do the same thing. Stroke needs to go to hospitals capable of treating patients that have stroke, and not just any stroke, because not all strokes are created equal. You have minor strokes, and you have severe strokes, and they are different in how they're treated. So emergent large vessel occlusion recently introduced this type of stroke where major cerebral artery is blocked. A major cerebral artery. So we're looking at a big stroke versus a smaller stroke. Elbow strokes have the highest rate of mortality among the strokes. Thrombolytics alone usually do not work for large vessel occlusions. So when I talk about thrombolytics, we'll talk about what the treatments are in a minute. And recent studies have shown that combined thrombolytic and endovascular procedures are the most effective treatment. So we'll talk about those treatments. So thrombolytic medications are those that go in and try and dissolve the clot. I can remember back in EMS, and some areas still do this, where they were giving thrombolytic therapy to patients that were having STEMIs out in the field. So if you were having an ST elevated MI out in the field, they would actually give uh, thrombolytics in the field to break up the clot in the heart. Some agencies, some places around the country still do that. We can't do that for stroke pre-hospital. I don't see us ever going that direction because we can't get a CAT scan done. But the idea of that is should not be foreign to us because we've had thrombolytics around for a while. The, the point being that uh, intervas interventional endovascular procedures are what they use to go in and actually pull a clot out. So there's two methods to actually treat these clots. Try to dissolve it with medication, or try to go in with a wire and a stent retriever and pull the clot out. <clears throat> so in order to have a successful stroke process, you have to have early symptom recognition, which is starts from community outreach to our EMS and fire rescue folks out in the field to be able to do that early recognition. Also the advanced pre-hospital triage, and we'll talk about this advanced pre-hospital triage in a minute. Transporting of patients to a designated stroke center and then early activation of the stroke team at the hospital. These are all part of these processes. So what can fire and EMS do? First, we have to very, look very closely at our pre-hospital stroke assessment tools as to what we're using now and our triage and transport processes. Right now, and I, just out of a show of hands, who's using Cincinnati Stroke Scale? Anybody? Cincinnati Pre-Hospital Stroke Scale? How about LAMS? 
What are you guys using? <laughs> fast? You're using fast, okay. All right. <clears throat> All right, so let's talk about that. So pre-hospital stroke scales are standardized assessment tools used to identify stroke and clear a path toward reperfusion. So we're identifying the stroke and we're trying to get that patient into the system to get them reperfused. All right. So in doing that, we have to look at this process. So we're going to take a little historical perspective and take a look at what, there's, what some of these things are out there. One of them being the Cincinnati Pre-Hospital Stroke Scale. Cincinnati Pre-Hospital Stroke Scale has been around for a long time. In my research, I tried going back, and about as far back as I could find data was back in the early 90s, although I think it may even predate that as well. So if you look at that, just simply in doing the math, we're looking at a stroke scale that's, what, uh, over 20 years old? Same stroke scale, 20 years later, and the majority of the country is still using it. How many things do you know in EMS that don't change in 20 years? <clears throat> so what is it? It's basically three data points. So you're looking at facial, droop, arm drift, and speech, those three things. Okay, now this is a scale that's been around for a very, very long time, very well publicized. You'll see it everywhere. Um, you'll see it in different languages, in different countries. It's been around for a long time, very, very popular. So let's take a look at what you're using now, FAST. So now it comes along FAST. FAST hasn't been around as long, but what is the difference between FAST and Cincinnati? Time. time. Other than that, it's the same score. <laughs> it really is. There's no difference to it. They add a time to the end of it. But why was FAST developed? Anybody know? It was developed for the public, not for EMS. It was never intended for EMS. It was developed for the public because it was the same Cincinnati pre-hospital stroke scale developed for the public sector because it has a nice moniker to it. It's FAST. It looks good. It displays well. When you have these posters out in the public, it looks good. It catches your attention. If you had the CPSS out there, it doesn't look as good. But FAST has a nice ring to it. So that's really all it is. They rebranded the Cincinnati Pre-Hospital Stroke Scale and called it FAST, but it's still the same scale. Now, again, well publicized. You see it everywhere. But even with this, 60% of all stroke patients still wait more than an hour to call EMS. So it's not been highly effective, but it's been somewhat effective. So even that, but again, keeping in mind that the stroke scale that you're using is what they've been pushing out to the public for years as a public domain type of a scale. So really what we should be doing in EMS and Fire Rescue should be something a lot more advanced than that. So we'll take a look at LAMS. LAMS is basically the same thing, again, with a different name. And what they did was they added a numeric value. So now instead of just having the face and the grip and the arm strength, now they took the same basic score and added a numeric value. Now there's some benefit to this, and actually we actually used Cincinnati for a while and added a numeric value to it. So on our Cincinnati for a short time, we basically said if you were positive on any one of the factors, you were a one for each. So if we gave somebody at the hospital at Cincinnati, we would say they're positive Cincinnati, positive two. And just having that numeric value kind of helped out the interventional staff and the ER doc from knowing how severe they were on Cincinnati. Not much different from LAMS. LAMS is basically the same thing. It's adding a numeric value to the same old scale. But again, it's the same old scale. So that becomes one of the issues that we have to work with. <clears throat> so one of the problems that we have as we're beginning to look at better triage tools is that the LA Motor Score, and again, Cincinnati and FAST, do not look at the cortical signs that are usually impaired with a large vessel occlusion stroke. So if we're looking for large vessel occlusion strokes, if we're looking to triage patients that either have minor or major strokes, these scales will not do it because it doesn't look at the cortical signs we need to look at that most interventionalists, and from the white paper that I'll show you in a minute came out about this, that says that it does not look for those cortical signs. <clears throat> so what I want to do and what we did was we basically added this to the list of old treatment options. So along with high flow oxygen for stroke patients, 
stopped doing that a long time ago also, okay? Lowering blood pressure, no, pri no procardia, no nitroglycerin, and Cincinnatian lamps. We threw them all into sort of the old bucket of all the old stuff we don't do anymore. And we decided it was time to move forward. So we, I already asked you guys, what are you guys using for your scale? You guys are mostly using FAST. So again, what changes have we seen in the last 10 or 20 years? So what changes have we seen in stroke care in the last 10 or 20 years from an EMS perspective? Probably hardly anything, right? I mean, I've been doing this for a long time. Really hasn't been much of a change. So why hasn't stroke seen much of an evolution and change? I think personally is you're looking at a low acuity problem versus the high acuity problems that seem to get all the attention. So cardiac arrest, trauma, these things that, you know, when they happen, people are screaming, people are bleeding, people have broken arms and legs and they're all busted up in car accidents. Those things get the attention. You're having to do CPR, you're having to do, you're having to bag somebody, intubate somebody, those things get the attention. Hell, even overdose patients. We're getting, South Florida, we're getting overrun with Flocka patients that we're having to give ketamine out in the field and having to, to hold these people down because they're running around naked and they're like superheated and it takes five or six people to try to hold them down. You know, so even they're getting more attention in the short term than what stroke has gotten over the years. So we have to think about that, that whole idea of low acuity versus high acuity. How many times have you taken a stroke patient, those who have been in the field long enough, to the hospital, and that patient kind of got put into a room, sort of back in the corner, back there, and we never knew what happened to them, you know, kind of thing. And I'm not saying that's what happens today, but I've been doing this a long time, and I can tell you it's what had happened in the past. <clears throat> so what do we do? We have to realize that, first of all, EMS plays a critical role in improving stroke patient outcomes and decreasing neurologic injury. EMS does. <clears throat> so that being said, we need to look to move forward. And moving forward means a time to consider joining the race. So let's talk about race. This is the white paper on race. You can Google this, you can pull it up. It's about a six or seven page paper um, on the race scale. We have adopted this in South Florida. So when I speak about race, I don't speak about race as an idea. I speak about, some, about race as something that we've implemented and we've been using for quite some time now and it has been extremely successful. And we'll talk about that more in a minute. Basically what race is, and this is our race scorecard. So this is, that, this is literally the card that came off of my trucks. So aside from that, I took the phone number off the bottom. This is the actual card that our crews use out in the field. And we use this as our pre-hospital triage tool for patients. If you look at race, you'll see, oh, it doesn't work on the TVs. Oh well. You'll see the first three, facial palsy, arm motor function, leg motor function, are basically very similar to FAST or Cincinnati or LAMPS. So the first three data points are basically what you've been doing already. So there's not a whole lot of change. The important part are the last three. So the head and, head and gaze deviation, the aphasia, and the agnosia. Those three things are what are the new data points that you have to add and train your people on how to recognize those things. The nice part about race is that if you follow the card, you're just simply asking the questions on the card. So it doesn't get any more difficult than that. It's not hard to teach. It's not hard to use. Our crews are doing race scores on patients in about 90 seconds. It doesn't take very much time. After you've done it a few times, you get even better at it. So you kind of know what the questions are without even having to look at the card anymore. But we still have the cards in all the trucks. But it's a very good tool. Now you'll see on the bottom, for us, any score above a zero is a stroke alert, automatic stroke alert. Any score that's a five or greater, for us, is considered to be a large vessel occlusion patient, and we actually activate our stroke system by calling the EMS stroke hotline, and we start working them into the system. And we'll talk more about what our system is in a minute. <clears throat> we get that from this. If you take a look at the scale and you compare it to the NIH, RACE was actually developed somewhat from the NIH stroke scale. You guys are using NIH in the hospitals now. You've been using it for years. So when you look at a comparison of something to compare it to, you can compare this to the NIH. There's actually a bit of a cheat sheet that says that if you take a race and you add 10, I think it's either 9 or 10, to that score, you will get an equivalent NIH stroke scale also. So if you have a patient with a race of 6, 
and you add 9 to it and you have a 15, that would be about your equivalent. So if it's easier for you to understand from the hospital side, NIH, then just add the number to it. Now you say, okay, I have a 15 on the NIH. Gives you a better idea as to what, what number you're dealing with. So it's a matter of just being accustomed to certain scales. You guys aren't accustomed in the hospital to race. Out in the field, you'll become very accustomed to it once you start using it. But that's where the comparisons come from. And you see that on the right side, which is the NIH equivalent versus the race score. But it's the cortical signs that become the important part. So what we did was we took a look at the validation scale. And looking at the validation scale, you'll see that ischemic strokes with large vessel occlusion are those that are in black. The higher the number, the more prevalent or the, or the no, higher number of patients that actually had a large vessel occlusion. And then you had those without large vessel occlusion and you see how it starts from a higher number down to a lower number. So those two come together at five. So five became kind of our sweet spot. So we chose five as being our number for anything above a five would be considered a potential large vessel occlusion patient. Anything below a five, we're still going to consider as possibly being a minor stroke and that we will triage our patients accordingly based upon that score. <clears throat> so this allows us to identify stroke severity, just like we've been doing with ST elevation with 12 leads for years we finally have a way to see, is it a serious stroke or not? It's not just a stroke anymore. Now it's either a major stroke or a minor stroke, or not a severe stroke. So unlike Cincinnati and Lambs, which cannot do that, this allows us that pre-hospital triage and allows us to make transport decisions as far as where we may decide to take our patients, whether it be primary centers, comprehensive centers, stroke ready centers, whatever the classification here in, in Washington may be. I know in Florida there's only two, either primary or comprehensive. We only have two. You guys actually have, I think, aside from primary comprehensive, your state actually has level one, level two, level three. So you have a couple different you know, qualifications. So race is not perfect, but then again, neither are the other ones. And when I say that, I mean you must leave the ability for paramedic judgment. So why do I say that? Because you still have patients that will have a stroke and have symptoms like lack of coordination, lack of balance, worst headache of their life, things like this. The stroke scales don't pick up. None of them do. FAST won't pick them up, Cincinnati won't pick them up, LAMS won't pick them up, RACE won't pick them up. So if you're going to implement RACE, you must also implement the scale with the caveat of saying paramedic judgment. So you can still call that, that uh, stroke alert based simply upon paramedic judgment. That that paramedic or EMT who is there, whose spidey sensors are going off going, listen, I know this is a zero on the RACE, but I, this person's having the worst headache of their life, it may be a bleed, it may be something else, we're gonna go ahead and call the stroke alert. And we have to give them that ability to do that. So we always give them that out. So in addition to the race, we also allow for paramedic judgment because there are some ones that you won't catch with it. So who can perform race? Well, paramedics, EMTs. I don't see any reason why EMTs can't perform it. Quite frankly, we're looking now to push it to the nurses at the triage desk in the ED so that when a patient walks up to the emergency department and someone is complaining of stroke-like symptoms, if it only takes you a minute to a minute and a half to do a quick race score on somebody, then you're gonna have an, an actual number as you're working that patient back to the ED that you know what they are on the race already. We're also looking to take it to the triage desks of primary care centers and even nursing homes so that if they learn how to, have, how to work with race and we'll give them the cheat sheets and give them the cards. If you have a patient that has stroke-like symptoms, do a quick race scale on them. We may get there and find out the score's already been done for us, which is fantastic. If it comes over on dispatch that they're saying they have a race of five, we know what we're driving to already. So we can start that process even earlier. So these things become important, and there's really no reason we can't start to push this outreach out past just the hospital and past EMS. So let's talk about training. Training is really very simple. We basically we break it down into the six components. We look at our motor function, and we talk about, and the race scale actually tells you exactly what you're supposed to do. Extend the arm of the patient 90 degrees or 45 degrees if they're supine. If the patient's able to uh, hold their limb up for 10 seconds, then they're good. If they can't, then you will score them accordingly. That's it. 
So the, the, one of the nice parts about this scale is it tells you exactly what to do. We'll show them pictures as to what they're supposed to do. We'll look at each component when it comes to head and gaze deviation. As far as looking at the eyes and looking for gaze deviation, how to find that, how to actually see what gaze deviation looks, looks like. So we show them in the training, very, very simple, what gaze deviation looks like. We'll also show them what gaze deviation doesn't look like. So this is not right-sided gauge deviation. So we make sure we cover both sides. <clears throat> so really, race is only the beginning. It really becomes the whole process. That's the part that counts. So fire and EMS can start the process. We can start that process with using race. Now, I say race now because right now it's the current, probably the best scale out there pre-hospital. There may be other ones coming out in the next year or two. I've heard a lot of people talking about it at the different stroke conferences that they're actually working on race and trying to possibly come out with a newer version of it. So there may be other things that come out over time. But right now, race is about the best thing out there. So what can fire and EMS do? Well, we have to look at our pre-hospital tools. And we also have to take a look at our receiving hospitals, the emergency department process, our neuro cath lab process, and our inner facility transfer process. That's a big thing around here from my understanding. You guys do a lot of inner facility transfers here from hospital to hospital. There's only two comprehensive centers in the area. So obviously everybody who's outside that needs comprehensive has to be transferred in. So those inner facility transfer processes need to be really, really, really good because Time is brain. So if we can't, from a primary center at an outlying hospital, get that interfacility transfer process to get that ambulance at that hospital in a timely fashion and get that patient to a comprehensive center within a timely fashion where they can't be treated, then we're not doing ourselves any good. So we have to make sure those processes are in place as well. Just to give you an idea, now it's kind of not fair because in Broward County where I'm from, this is actually a, an example of the entire county. There's 18 hospitals in Broward County. Of the 18 hospitals, eight of them are comprehensive centers. I can walk outside and pull my driver out and hit a golf ball and hit a comprehensive center pretty much any direction I aim. <laughs> so it's a little unfair compared to here when you guys only have two. And, in my and this is, that's the state of Washington, right? You only have two in the state of Washington. I have eight in Broward County. There are three more in Dade County, and there are two more in Palm Beach County. So they're everywhere. The unfortunate part about that is, is this is really politics and is at its greatest, because there was only four comprehensive centers a year and a half ago. But after we started this process, and we started really ramping up stroke care in South Florida, so did the comprehensives come. So next thing you know, everyone's becoming comprehensive. So that became probably as much of a hindrance as it became a help also, because we have problems with that too. But that gives you an idea as to where I am coming from. We don't worry as much, although we do still have problems with inner facility transfers. We still have patients that go to primary centers that we can't get that patient out of that primary center to a comprehensive in what I consider to be an acceptable amount of time. And to me, that's an hour. So we're like two, and a, two hours, two and a half hours regularly. So that to me is not acceptable. That's one of the things we have to work harder on. So we have to look at our focus on our workflow and try to work for better hospital triage, faster times, streamline processes, and innovative devices. So what we did was we took advantage of all these major endovascular trials that came around at the International Stroke Conference that was out, not this, last, not this last one, last month, but the year before. When these trials all came out, they actually finally came out and said that endovascular therapy, which is to go inside the brain and pull the clot out, is the best treatment for these large vessel occlusions. They came out and said that, finally. It's now level 1A evidence, which means it's the right thing to do. It is the best treatment. So from a pre-hospital standpoint, we have to understand that's the best treatment and make sure we get our patients and understand how time is a player in this and get those patients there as quickly as possible. So Target Stroke, which is the American Heart Association, has their metrics. They want door-to-treatment time in less than 60 minutes. So from an EMS and fire rescue standpoint, you guys should be expecting nothing less. So your hospital should be treating your patients in less than 60 minutes. 
It's target stroke. It's, it's the Heart of American Association guidelines. So you guys should hold your hospitals to that standard to try to get these patients treated in less than 60 minutes. So American Stroke Association says, in order to have a good system, you got to have pre-hospital notification. You got to have a stroke alert system, which you guys already do. You have to bypass the ED bay and go straight to the CAT scanner. They should be doing that. If they're not, we should be trying to figure out why not and trying to get that to happen. We should be doing going back to the CAT scanner. Keep IV TPA in the ER if possible. Pre-mix your IV TPA. Rapid CT interpretation. Await labs only if there's a concern for coagulopathies. And then, of course, administer the IV TPA and the CAT scanner. Now, this is the medication route. So this is that door to needle time in less than 60 minutes. In order to achieve that goal, you need to have these, these processes in place or you're never gonna get there. <clears throat> so we're gonna process improvement, redesign our workflow, advanced pre-hospital triage, early activation of the cath lab, door to needle consistency less than 60 minutes, and door to reperfusion less than 90 minutes. That's having to go up to the endovascular suite and go into your cath lab. They want that door to groin puncture in less than 90 minutes, okay? And then track your core metrics. So run your stroke alerts like you do your cardiac alerts, like you do your trauma alerts. Get that, that emphasis, get those team members going, get them moving for stroke, not just for STEMI and for trauma. <clears throat> so this is what we did in Broward just to give you guys an idea. So when I talk about this, again, I'm talking about this, this not from the standpoint of this is an idea or a theory. This is actually our process. We've done this. We've been doing this since 2014. So I'll give you an idea as to where we are. So this was our old process. It was a basically what we call a linear process. Patient, we arrive at scene, we would do a basic Cincinnati pre-hospital stroke scale. We would call into the hospital through telemetry, alert the hospital, hey, we have a stroke alert coming in, yada, yada, yada. We would get to the emergency room. The ER doctor would evaluate the patient. He would go ahead and order imaging. The patient would go to CAT scan. At that point, patient would be held in the ED while neuro was contacted and neuro was consulted with. If neuro was on board, they decided they want to go ahead and move forward. They would go ahead and activate the cath lab suite and they would transfer the patient to the cath lab suite. And then at some point they'd finally get around the groin puncture. In order to get a cath lab suite up and running takes about how long? Here locally, how long do you think it takes? 20 minutes, 30 minutes, 30 minutes. About normal for most areas, about 30 minutes. Whether And if it's after midnight, that those times could change. But um, that gives you an idea. This is what we looked at when we looked at our system. And this was not good enough. So what we decided to do was change it. And we went to what's called a parallel workflow. So now, with the parallel process, we arrive on scene and we do a race score. So based upon that race score, we take that number. If that number is a five or higher, we actually will call the neurointerventional physician on the phone directly from the scene. I've got his phone right here on my phone. Every single one of the iPhones on my rescue trucks have him on speed dial. And they will call him right from the scene. When you saw that race card it had up earlier with the X's on the bottom, that's his cell phone number. He answers his cell phone 24-7, 365. I took his number out because uh, the first time I gave this presentation, I forgot, and I'm like, holy, oh my gosh. And this was actually like EMS World. So there was like 100 people out there who I just gave my doctor's phone number out to. But we'll actually call him on the phone. He actually will uh, allow us to FaceTime with him directly from the scene. So if we call him, our crews call and say, hey, doc, I got a race score of seven. He'll usually ask a few questions. If he wants to see the patient, he'll say, can you switch over to FaceTime? And they'll hit the FaceTime button and switch over to FaceTime. And we'll actually FaceTime right on scene and actually allow him to do an evaluation of the patient right on scene. Based upon that evaluation, this is the neurointerventional doctor doing the evaluation. How you set your system up is entirely up to you. But for us, it's a neurointerventional doctor. He is able to do his evaluation. And while we're still on scene, he activates the cath lab before we ever leave. So we're still sitting on scene. We've barely been there for 10 minutes and we've already got the cath lab activated if in fact the patient has a high race score. That 20 or 30 minutes to activate that cath lab is now happening right down here. So now we arrive at the ED, patient 
gets evaluated by the ED doctor right there at the triage desk because he wants to make sure it's not a stroke mimic or something that he wants to verify first. Goes right to imaging, and then from imaging gets transferred right to the suite for groin puncture. We've saved all of this time by running this process in parallel. So we've shaved a great deal of time off. So how effective has that been? Well, let me show you. These are our times from January through July of 2014. We had an average time of 184 minutes. From August until December of 14, we dropped that time down to 62 minutes. We didn't cut it in half, we cut it into a third. That's an average, which means there are better and worse, but it's an average time. But what I think is actually more important about this slide is not so much the times, which are in fact, I think, fantastic, but look at the number of cases. 16 cases treated during a seven month period versus 48 cases treated in a six month period. Less time, more cases. We tripled the number of cases. Where'd those patients come from? They were always there. The fact is, is that we were now capturing them where we weren't capturing them before because we were taking an aggressive stance on stroke. We were identifying more stroke patients. We were capturing more stroke patients, not only pre-hospital, but also in the ED. And we were getting more patients to be treated. So we tripled the number of patients being treated. I, ha I hear this all the time when I give this talk about, you know, hospitals competing with hospitals, you know, oh, we don't want you to take our patients away, you know, we don't want to have too many patients. And there's always a lot of politics involved. And one of the big polit pol political aspects is we don't want to lose patients. And I tell people all the time, if you look at our numbers, you'll see that we didn't lose patients, we gained patients. So we actually got identified more patients than we had before. So again, looking at the numbers, when comparing no EMS alert at all to EMS alert with cath lab activation, and then EMS alert with cath lab activation and pre-imaging, we were able to cut our times down in half. <clears throat> this is door to cath lab arrival time. Sorry, can I ask you a question? Yes. Um, how many of those patients received TPA? Was it sure in the parallel process? Those patients were all, uh, uh, went up to the IR suite. I don't know how many of them got TPA in the process. Okay. I, I, I have to check with Meta and find out the answer to that question. But the parallel process does include TPA? If, if they need it, it depends on the patient. It depends on what the interventionist wants to do. Sometimes he does, sometimes he doesn't. Sometimes they'll go without it. Okay. So it depends on, on what he wants to do. Because he's, he's a part of it so early on, he can make those decisions early on. So he's not having to come in and find out that they already started IV TPA. He may decide we're going to go without it and just go ahead and take the patient straight to the interventional suite. So it's, entirely, it's up to him. Um, again, this is before and after implementing the ASA target stroke guidelines. So from January through July of 14, 82 minutes. From January through July of 15, 44 minutes. Okay, so the numbers are fantastic. We really have made a big difference by, tr by changing our process and how we do things. Again, looking at the cases, 13 cases versus 27 cases. In this particular data group, we doubled our cases. So we're capturing more patients. We're getting more patients. That's probably one of the biggest things out there. I know if you've been working in this field long enough, you know how many people get slipped to the cracks and don't get treated. I've sat in emergency rooms and watched doctors talk patients out of IV TPA. I literally sat there when I was teaching one night and watched an ER doctor talk a 32-year-old woman out of, giving, out of getting IV TPA with her and her husband were in the room and she said he walked up and told her, you know, we can give you this medication, you know, but it has all these side effects. And by the time he, got, he ran through his whole list of side effects, he scared the crap out of them and they didn't want to take the medication. After he left, I sat and talked with him for a few minutes and they changed their mind. He gave her the IBTPA and within about eight minutes, she already began regaining all of her faculties back and within a very short period of time, she was back to an NIH of, uh, of a zero. It was fantastic. But you know, you watch that happen, you know patients fall through the cracks. So you know, we love seeing the much more aggressive posture and treating people out there that this tends to bring along with it and also captures more patients. 
So this just shows some of the data versus some of the published data that's out there. Our times, uh, door to groin puncture versus groin puncture to start a revascularization on first pass and uh, door to reperfusion times. And our times versus that blue being Memorial Hospital and red being the published data. <clears throat> So our success was through careful selection. So this is the process. So this is our score. This is our, our scale that we use. This is how we do it. It really is not very difficult to do. So anyone who's a five or greater goes right to the EMS stroke hotline and we start the process through them. If they're less than a five, there's still a stroke alert. They still go to the hospital. We just don't call the interventionalist. That's the only difference, but they still go to the hospital, they still get the same treatment. The big difference is, is those that are five or higher, because they have a possible large vessel occlusion that's gonna require interventional treatment, we wanna make sure he's on board early. And he loves the idea. <clears throat> I'm not sure he sleeps very much, but you know, he loves the idea. <laughs> This is uh, actually the screensaver from our iPhones. It's actually on there. And Dr. Mehta, who's been an absolute stroke champion in South Florida, um, has been fantastic in this whole process. Believe me, I could not have done this alone. This was in conjunction with him and the ER doctors and the stroke people from the hospital. It was the community that brought this whole thing together. Now, when we started this whole process, it was just my agency. From the time that I started the process, the other four agencies in the south part of the county all joined in. Within six months of that, the other agencies in the central part of the county were all wanting to join in. Before, I think, the end of next month, the entire county is all going to be using race. Now they're trying to figure out how they can do the parallel process. So they're moving all to race. Now they're trying to figure out how to get their doctors on board to try and do some version of this parallel process. <clears throat> So again, it is a cooperative process. You have to meet with the hospitals, you have to work with your chiefs, your EMS chiefs, your EMS coordinators, and get everyone together on the same page. So we're all working together. Use your stroke councils, your healthcare coalitions. You can leverage hospital against hospital. I tell you what, before Dr. Mehta came to Memorial Hospital, Memorial Hospital was what I consider to be a poor performer in the emergency room. And I changed that through hospital against hospital. I was actually giving a talk at, at Memorial Hospital to their stroke team. And in the process of that talk, they had asked me, you know, why aren't you guys bringing us more stroke patients? And I always tell people, never ask me a question you don't truly want to hear the answer to. And I told her, I said, because your stroke system sucks. And I said it just like that. So I try not to use bad words if I can, but I, you know, occasionally it comes out. <clears throat> and they're like, you know, oh, you know, what do you mean? And they all took kind of offense to that. And I said, well, as much as I hate to say that, that fire and EMS somewhat respond to the dog and pony show, they do. So you have hospital A over here that when my guys and girls arrive at the hospital, that patient goes right to the triage desk, gets triage banded, and goes straight to CAT scan. They get their CAT scan. If in the CAT scan the patient needs IV TPA, they hang IV TPA and they give that thrombolytic medication right in the CAT scan. They go to your hospital, Patient goes to the triage desk, gets a band, goes to a room. And then from that room, a nurse will come over, a doctor will come over, will assess them, and then order a CAT scan. And then the patient will make their way over to CAT scan. There's no rush, there's no fuss, there's no nothing really kind of going on. Where hospital A, they're jumping all over it with their stroke team, and with you guys, it's just kind of like, you know, yeah, you're doing the stroke alert, but you're not really doing a whole lot different than what you were doing if it wasn't a stroke alert. So I go, they see that. You know, and fire rescue and EMS will tend to always fall back on the mom rule. If it was your mom that had this problem, where would you go? To the hospital that's doing all this work or the hospital that's not? You're going to go to the hospital that's doing all this work. It just is what it is. Can I tell you that within seven days, I was back at the hospital teaching another class, and the, the ER manager saw me in the hallway and looks over at me, and she says, you, she says, come here. And I'm as usual, I'm thinking, oh, God, what did I do now? So um, I walked over to her, and she says, uh, she says, you know, two nights ago, we had our first uh, stroke alert that we took straight to CAT scan. She said, we had patient in the CAT scan, patient needed IV TPA. We had a door to needle time of 32 minutes. And I was like, I was, I was like really? I, it, was just, it was amazing. And I can tell you, as a, as a person that goes out and lectures all the time, when you hear that back from somebody who you've talked to, 
and that they made that difference, there's no better feeling in the entire world. And they changed their process simply because of that, because they realized they were not going to be outdone by the other hospital, they fixed it. They didn't, they just did it on a whim. They just had a stroke patient came in and they said, let's just do it. And they got the ER doctor to go with it and they just did it. And that, and it, within 32 minutes, they had a uh, door needle time, which is fantastic. They have since changed their process completely. And now that's their normal process. Now, what they didn't know, what my guys, my guys and girls don't know from a field perspective is that Hospital A, when those patients went up to the interventional suite, they had a terrible interventional doctor up there. Did not like treating patients, didn't like treating wake-up strokes, had a horrible bedside manner, was not a great practitioner. They didn't know that. But the dog and pony show you saw down in the ER looked really, really good. But fire and EMS rarely ever knows what goes on past those doors once they leave the ED. So I know that because I stay very close with my stroke specialists in my area and, they, and I find out what's going on behind the scenes. So by getting them to go over to this other hospital who had a much better interventional group, we were actually getting our patients treated better and they were getting cared for better and actually having better work done. So it actually worked out better for them anyway. But that's one of those things from a fire and EMS perspective you want to find out is find out how good a performer your hospital is. So with that, we also have these online dashboard uh, things that we look at. With a, we actually open up the interventional suite to our people. So if my people bring in a stroke case that goes up to the interventional suite, I allow them to go upstairs and go watch the stroke uh, case being run upstairs. So if we're not too busy, so they can go to the CAT scan or watch the CAT scan. If patient goes upstairs to go to the cath lab, I allow them to go to the cath lab. And I give them about a half an hour to go up there and watch the process before they have to come back down and get back in service again. But I want them to buy in to the process so I let them go up there and watch that because it's a big deal for them and they enjoy it and it gets buy-in and that's important because I want my guys to be motivated we help participate in research we get good rapid feedback uh, from the uh, hospitals on cases like this so one of the things that we get is something like this this was a patient we had 74 year old lady that was brought in with an NIH of 16 uh, one of my trucks brought her in after she was treated and she was treated in less than an hour, if you look at the times, from 529 to 626, she walked out with a final NIH of one. So treatment time of less than 60 minutes. And that's the clot they pulled out. So this is the feedback we get, and I send these to our crews so the crews can see what happened, because we so often don't get that feedback. You drop these patients off, and you just don't know what happened after that. I mean, I get people ask me all the time, you know, how'd that person do? And I have to go back and try and find out. They come to us and actually give us that feedback. So it's really, really awesome. Not just that, but Dr. Mehta himself will oftentimes come to me. And this was actually a text message I got at about, uh, I think this was uh, the one I got at like close to midnight. And I love him for that. But he can be, sometimes he doesn't realize what time it is and I'm trying to sleep. He might have to be awake, but I don't have to be awake. So this is his text message. Hi, Mark. We had a Hallandale EMS circulate overnight. Patient's wife was given a choice of AMC versus regional. So we give our patients a choice. Because we have so many hospitals in our area, we tell them which hospital you want to go to. And I have two comprehensive centers that book in my city. And I give them a choice of one or the other. So one of your crew members recommended regional. Now we're working with regional very, very closely, so I encourage my crews to recommend regional because they are the best stroke center for us. And they did. They went ahead and did that. Dr. Meta treated that patient. You can see the clot that came out and patient regained full function while still on the table. The wife and family were extremely grateful. And this is a text message I get afterwards. So as much as I hate him waking me up at midnight, I, you can't help but not read these things and love what you're reading. I mean, it's fantastic. So it's, it's, good, it's good to see. And he sends the pictures and everything. So we get things like this. This was actually a patient that was brought in from uh, Miami-Dade County. And again, the crew gave the family the choice between AMC and Memorial, and the family chose Memorial. Again, another patient, 89 years old, paralyzed in the left side, now moving their arm and leg fully. And again, family's extremely thankful. I mean, you can't, you can't write this stuff, you can't make this stuff up. These are patients, and these, these three cases, these last three cases, all happen within the past two weeks. So I literally just put the, I added these three slides in, part of it on the flight over here today, because they're, they're so brand new. Now this one, this one was just, uh, I want to say two days ago. This is one of the challenges that we have that we are still trying to sort out. 
So this patient, 58-year-old patient, was taken to Cleveland Clinic by BSO, and despite the symptoms, they still went to Cleveland Clinic. Cleveland Clinic is a comprehensive stroke center, but Cleveland Clinic's neurointerventionalist was not on duty. So we have this challenge now that we're dealing with with these comprehensive centers in South Florida that are saying they're comprehensive, but in fact are not full-time, 24-7, 365 comprehensive. Their doctor's on vacation for a week, and they don't tell anybody. And in this particular case here, the doctor was not available, and they didn't tell anybody. So rescue took the patient to the comprehensive center. Thankfully, they were able to get this patient out of there in just over an hour and brought over to Memorial West where he was treated by Dr. Mehta and then had a good outcome as well. But this is one of those things where we have these challenges also. So even with all the hospitals we have, we still have challenges like this too where we're having a hard time getting patients to the right hospital from fire rescue and EMS and then having interfacility transfer processes also. So some of the innovative programs that we use, FaceTime, we talked about the FaceTime pilot. We also use something called Pulsera. I don't know if any of you guys are familiar with Pulsera. Pulsera is basically an iPhone app. What Pulsera is, and I'll show you a picture of it, is this. It allows us to activate a stroke alert right through this iPhone app. So when, our, when my crews hit Pulsera on their iPhone and the app comes up, it'll ask them for about five things. Patient's name, age, last known well time, the witness, witness's phone number, and their race score. Once they get those things put in, they hit the button that says stroke alert. Once they hit stroke alert, it automatically will downstream ping the ER doctor, the stroke coordinator, the nurse manager, and everybody else downstream just like that. So they now know a stroke alert is coming in. Once the ER doctor gets that, he will then look at it and see what information he sees, and then he can push a button that will then downstream activate neurology. And if they want to keep pushing it forward all the way to the interventional suite, they'll do that. But we run our, our stroke alerts through Pulsera by activating everybody through iPhone apps, and the activations are immediate. The nice part about this is, is if the interventional doctor or the ER doctor decides that they want to call the rescue and ask some questions or call the witness, because the phone numbers are already in there, they hit one button and they call that person. So they have immediate notification and activation of those people right there from the scene. So we've been piloting this for about six months now. It's working pretty good. We're still working on it. There have their new versions coming out, I think, any day now. So it actually works out very well. The um, this patient uh, here, this patient we actually was one we used race and Pulsera on with the door to device time of 85 minutes. So we actually used, utilized Pulsera here. Miami Day doesn't have Pulsera now that it's BSO, but we used it on that patient. <clears throat> so it's kind of a neat thing. It also allows our crews to find out their times because all the times are time stamped. And then they can go back and they can look at the Pulsera app after they left the hospital and they can see when the patient had CAT scan, they can see if the patient goes to the interventional suite, what time they got there, and they can see when the stroke alert is over because they'll come up and say stroke alert is completed and they'll get information from there as well. So it actually gives us some back end information as well, which we never had before. Another thing that we use is, uh, is uh, ESO Solutions, is Health Data Exchange. This is something that we can actually tie our EPCR, our, our fire rescue electronic patient care report, right into the hospital system. Memorial system uses Epic, and now with the help of ESO solutions, when we hit download on our, our Toughbook tablets, instead of actually printing a copy of a report someplace, it actually takes that report and dumps it straight into Epic, right into the hospital system. And it will actually begin populating the EMS areas where those data points match up. So we actually populate those areas as well. So that being said, all of my guys can log in to ESO Solutions and they get a dashboard that will show them every patient they transported to Memorial Hospital and will show them once they've been discharged, what the discharge diagnosis was, what happened to the patient, and give them that back end information we never had before. So that's something else that works out very, very well as far as some of the new, new technologies that are out there. Would you Reemphasize that we've been battling with the legal departments of Swedish and Providence Health System for, for years now to get uh, HD turned on, and we just suffered a major setback when one side decided that it doesn't meet the 
criteria. Criteria for what? We don't know. But, but we, it, it, I mean, HIPAA is always the buzzword. It's all HIPAA, HIPAA, HIPAA. ESO is all ready to go. Oh, yeah. Just in Austin, they're ready to turn it on tomorrow. They've done everything they can do, mm -hmm. and we cannot get the legal people up here to allow us to turn the switch on. I mean, they're allowed, I mean, from within the, the, the product, you're allowed to pick exactly what data points will then show up. It's all, it's all set up in our county. Yeah, so I don't, I don't. I just want you to reemphasize to the audience yeah. that we are ready to pull the trigger on this tomorrow if we can just get the attorneys to sign. Where are the attorneys at right now? Let's call them. <laughs> but I, I can say that we're missing at Crawford's, but we're missing, we have lost um, the PCRs in 20 to 30% of our people. It doesn't exist. And ESO is only in there for a month. So I can't look back on it and do anybody at protection. So we have an incomplete record. We, we're, we, are, we are ready to go tomorrow. And it's all set up. And, and it's all, Austin has it ready to go. Mm -hmm. They just need approval. One of the big things that the hospital liked about this was prior to us going to ESO, all of our reports were actually printed out and then handed off to the usually the unit secretary at the, at the triage desk at the station one area. And then she'd have to either scan those reports into the system or make sure they were added to the medical record at some point. Well, when JACO decides to come in and do your inspections, at any point in time, they can, they can you know, say, okay, I wanna see the EMS report on this patient. And you have to show them EMS report. If the hospital can't produce that EMS report, they're dinged for that. And the hospital knows that. So every time they get dinged for not having an EMS report, be it their fault or not, they're dinged for that. By moving to this system, it eliminates it completely because now that report is actually pushed straight into Epic, right into the system. They no longer have to worry about meeting that measure when it comes to EMS reports. So that alone was a big push to get them to go over to ESO because the reports are in the system. As soon as we hit the upload button, it goes into the system and ESO tracks it to make sure the transfers happen. Because I'll get calls back from them that'll say that, you know, this group of people haven't been transferred over to Memorial System yet, we're working on the problem, and then usually an hour or so later, we found the problem, they've all been put in the system, we're comp you know, fully compliant. So they, f they, they check back and we know that those people have all been put in the system. So it's been working very, very well. But from an EMS perspective, our guys love being able to go back in and look at their patients and actually see what happened to the patients. So that's probably one of the biggest benefits for us because I get tired of being called, hey, what happened to that person? Well, go look at your dashboard and you can find out. I don't have to go do it for you. So it's been a great system so far. We really, we really do like it. I hope you guys have a chance to use it because I think you guys will like it. Ultimately, on both ends, you guys will like it. I think you really will. Um, triage, this, I think Elmer Fudd created tw triage because it sounds like something Elmer Fudd would do, doesn't it? This is triage. I don't, it's, it's, a, it's a kind of a Pulsera kind of a thing. I don't know much about it, but it's one of the ones that are out there. So I, I, I saw it at one of the conferences, so I brought it up. <clears throat> so again, some things we have to think about. When we started doing this program, we were, you know, we've really gotten on the whole idea of strokes and getting patients treated. It didn't take very long to where we were identifying more and more patients that we also realized we started finding pediatric patients and we started finding patients that were pregnant and we started finding patients that we didn't always have before for whatever reason, we didn't recognize them or they were, they were undiagnosed or misdiagnosed in the field and now we have them have to figure out what to do with them. And there's nothing worse than showing up to a hospital with a pediatric stroke patient and having that comprehensive center say, I can't take that. We don't have a pediatric ICU. We don't have pediatric interventionalists here. You, you gotta go someplace else with that patient. So we had to find out within a short period of time which hospitals were gonna commit to taking pediatric patients. And right now, we only have two in the entire county. So we had to figure that part out. Same with our pregnancy patients and things like that. So those were things we began looking at that we didn't see before. We began really taking a closer look at wake up strokes. So let me ask you, here, what is your time factor for calling a stroke alert? How many hours out? Six? Anybody else? Anything more than that? Yeah. So out in the field, from a pre-hospital standpoint, if a patient had last known well of eight hours ago, are they a stroke alert? No. In Broward County, 24 hours out. We do that simply because 
the wake up strokes. If you go to six hours and you have a wake up stroke, does anybody know when that stroke happened? I can tell you from looking at the data from what a lot of the studies are saying is that the majority of wake up strokes, the stroke started within one to two hours of them waking up. So if we're in fact eliminating these wake up stroke patients that may have had that stroke within one to two hours of actually waking up, and some of the studies are saying the patients are actually waking up because of the symptoms of the stroke, that they're feeling the symptoms and waking up, then just think of all the people we're missing that could possibly be treated. So we changed it. We actually went from, we originally were six hours at one point, then went to eight hours, then went to 12 hours, and now we're at 24 hours. And actually, Dr. Mehta says, I don't even really care about time so much anymore, but he's sticking with 24 hours for right now, that he actually wants to do the assessment himself to verify that he does or doesn't want to treat somebody. Now, he may do, the, at, that, at that time frame, the system may not run quite so fast. So they may actually do more testing. So he may be doing you know, more, uh, more imaging to find out what the, their penumbra, what the mismatch is from penumbra and core and things like that to find out whether he's gonna treat or not, but he's still getting them in the system. So he's still bringing those patients up to 24 hours out, still in the system. Now, those numbers that you saw earlier, 13 versus 27, those extra patients, those double and triple numbers of patients, may be those patients that were captured that may comprise a part of that, those patients that were now captured that were never captured before, that were just the ones that fell through the cracks because they were too far out. So we're very fortunate in that regard in that, you know, he's very aggressive when it comes to that. So, you know, we try, that's kind of our thing, leave no stroke behind. <clears throat> so how do we improve fire rescue? Is improving fire rescue and EMS really like turning a battleship? Because it shouldn't be. If the advanced techniques, if the advanced technologies are out there, then fire rescue and EMS should be embracing those new technologies and new techniques, including potentially changing your pre-hospital triage tool for stroke. Because if we've been using the same one for over 20 years, or a facsimile thereof, then maybe it's time to move forward and try to find something else. Because the last thing that we wanna do is to be 200 years of history completely unimpeded by progress. And I've heard that about the fire rescue service for years, that fire rescue is, I mean, look at backboards. We've been putting backboards on patients forever. They told us to stop using backboards like two or three years ago, and we're still doing it. Why? Because we've always done it because it's 200 years of history unimpeded by progress, because it is so hard to make fire rescue and EMS change. So this is one of those things, we can't let that be the case here. We have to try to stay on top of things. So there's a number of resources that are out there. American Stroke Association has uh, their websites. They've got mobile applications you can use. They have posters and pads and outreach and learning tools. Uh, Medtronic itself actually has what's called American CME. So if you need CMEs and you want to get some stroke education, you can log into this website and you can actually get some stroke education and CMEs right through the website. <clears throat> I think there are one and a half uh, CMEs for each of the two. They also have a website called Take Two Minutes to Tell Two People. This website actually has uh, personal stories of stroke patients and they told their story from beginning to end. So you can actually read what people, what happened to them and their process and how they, what they had to go through. So it's kind of interesting. So in conclusion, we need to look at updating our stroke system of care, looking at updating our advanced stroke triage tools, better integration with our stroke centers because we cannot do this alone and improve our process. If we do these things, the process will improve on its own. But you guys have to work together to make it happen. And you've got great people here. The fact that you're here right now means that you guys want to do something. So that's, otherwise I would assume you could have had dinner someplace else and not heard me ramble on for the last hour. So I'm guessing you guys want to do something. So that's the whole idea is to try to move forward and see what we can do. So that's my talk. Thank you guys. <laughs>